Welcome everybody on YouTube. Today I wanted to give two videos talking about the um, interaction between Wasserstein distances and uh, GANs. I'll say briefly what those are and also how that relates to kantorovich rubinstein duality. So all this material is for, from this very nice blog by Vincent Herman. Um, so the, many of the images and, and the ideas I learned and from his blog post. So thank you very much, Vincent. I'm only going to say a little bit about GANs, but GANs, I think the S should be lowercase. GANs stand for Generative Adversarial Networks, and they're a great way of creating fake images or fake data that have realistic components. So the basic idea is, well, let me tell you the output, and then let me tell you roughly how it's constructed. This is not an image of a real person, okay? This is something constructed by a neural network where random noise was fed in. And this network got really good at taking random noise and producing a random face. So I, I personally could not tell that this is not a real person. Um, you know, so the network gets, gets incredibly good. So th that's maybe what the G stands for, generative. You're generating um, fake images or fake data, things like that. Adversarial tells you a little bit how this is done. So the way that you, you build a GANs is you have two neural networks, one which produces fake objects and the other which tries to detect fake objects, okay? And they train sort of in sequence. And as at first the generator is just producing, you know, random noise, but, and the detector is detecting that, hey, this is not a real image of a face, it's just random noise. But then, you know, the generator gets better and starts creating, you know, like cartoon-like smiley faces that are fooling the detector. But then the detector gets better and, and catches all those as fakes. And together, they just get better and better at creating fake images and detecting them. Um, so that, that's the rough idea of, of GANs. They're one type of neural network. Wasserstein GANs are a popular topic. Wasserstein GANs are ways to train GANs more efficiently using the ideas of Wasserstein distances. More broadly, Wasserstein distances, optimal transport are becoming a, a more and more important thing in machine learning and neural networks, in particular for training effectively. It relates a little bit to uh, the geodesics, you know, that we talked about a couple of video ago, videos ago. Um, you know, when you, when you um, want to Tra uh, transform f into h, right? Most people would say that the intermediate function is somewhere here, as opposed to so like the sum of those two, right? And so if you want to look at the gradient to go from f to h, you know, you'd want the gradient maybe just to move f in that direction, as opposed to shrinking this half and raising this half. Um, so gradients are used all the time in neural networks. And if you can take gradients in more natural spaces, then your network might be trained in, in more intuitive ways. I, I won't say too much about GANs in this video, but that's, that's part of the motivation um, for the blog post to explain optimal transport in Wasserstein distances for people who are interested in the Wasserstein GANs paper. I want to give a brief review of optimal transport and, and Wasserstein distances, and we'll, we'll set it up as a linear program in this video, and then consider the dual program in the next. So pretend that R and theta are two measures. For simplicity, we'll assume that they're measures on the same space. You know, so this left-hand point is the same as this left-hand point, and this right-hand point is the same as this right-hand point. Um, and, and, and in these drawings, R and theta are indeed just measures on the real line. So the horizontal axis here is the real line. And the height of each bar sort of tells you how, how much mass you have at each point on the real line. So theta is unimodal, whereas R is bimodal, it is two um, humps. The idea of optimal transport is what's the most efficient way to move all the mass in R onto the mass in theta. So 
schematically, um, Vincent Terman has, has drawn here one transport plan. So you could take this mass, this bit of mass that's in the R measure and split it into two. And then some of it goes here and the rest of it goes here. And so you build up the theta measure by taking the R measure and cutting it into pieces and rearranging things. Okay, so, you know, this beige collection of mass in R might get split up into three pieces. There's a third bit um, that to form theta. A nice, a nice visual of, of this above transport plan is, is drawn below on the left. Okay, so you can think of a transport plan as a joint probability density function. Your, your original measures, R and theta, are just measures on in one dimension, but the transport plan is a joint probability density you know, that's, that's telling you how to transport. So for example, we saw that this bit of theta of R was cut up into two to form theta. So where was that? Right here. This bit of R was cut up into two to form theta. And that's why two entries of this transport plan matrix are non-zero. They're saying from this measure in R, from this mass in R, split it up into two and send this much of it um, to this part of theta and send this much of it to this part of theta. You see that? So um, the transport plan, every entry tells you how much to mass to send from one part of R to one part of theta. And it's a joint probability distribution whose marginal in the vertical direction has to recover theta and whose marginal is in the horizontal direction, if you sum all these rows, has to recover R. Um, important for setting this up as a linear program is we also need to know the distances between points in R space. So if I want to you know, move this mass to here and here, I need to know the distance that I'm moving it. And we're just on the real line and um, so the distance from a point to itself is zero, but then as you move further away from the diagonal, as you're transporting the mass further and further, you're paying a higher transport cost for moving mass, you know, from the very left from, to the very right, or, um, yeah, or from the very right to the very left. Questions so far? Let's write this as a linear program. Our transport plan, it's a huge matrix, but we're gonna vectorize it. So take all the columns of this matrix and just stack them on top of each other to get a really, really long vector, right? So if I have n uh, columns and rows, I'm not gonna have a vector of length n squared encoding all of these possible uh, transport plan variables. And similarly, let's vectorize this matrix of distances, and that's going to give our, our cost uh, vector. We're trying to minimize the sum of distances times how much mass was moved along that distance. So once I vectorize things to get our, our cost vector and our vector variables, because we're trying to find this transport plan, you know, I want to I want to minimize. The, the sum of products, you know, this square times this square, how much mass did I move this distance, plus this square times this square, how much mass did I move that distance, plus this square times this square, how much mass did I move that distance, etc. You go all the way down and you, and you add up the products of, of all the corresponding um, squares to get how much mass was moved how far. That's what we're trying to minimize, the total cost of a transport plan. X encodes our transport plan. And uh, yeah, those are the distance costs. But we need constraints on our transport plan. And these constraints are gonna encode 
that our transport plan actually has to be a joint probability density, dis, uh, density function with marginals R and theta. So here's a nice schematic showing you that. Um, you know, in, the, in, in this problem, our matrix is A, but they've just written down a transpose because um, it's a little easier to look at. Here is our vector of um, variables, x, and gamma x1, y1 is just telling you how much mass is being moved from um, point 0.1 in R to point 0.1 in theta. More generally, gamma xi yj is telling you how much mass is being moved from point xi in uh, measure r to yj in measure theta. So when I multiply matrix A by this vector of variables x, I have to get this vector of constraints B. And let's look at what the various constraints are saying. So when I multiply A times X, you know, the, um, the first entry is just, is just um, we just have ones all the way down here. So I just get the sum of all these, okay? So when I sum all of these terms, I get how much mass was moved from X1 to any Y. So how much mass was moved from X1 to any Y? Well, that's just how much mass was in R at X1. So that's just, you know, this, this height here, okay? And then when I, when I look at this part of the matrix, okay, when I multiply X by A, I get the sum of all these. And so how much mass was moved from Xn? Well, that has to be the amount of mass in R at point Xn, just this amount right here. So this half of the matrix is encoding that the marginals in the horizontal direction recover the measure R. This half of the matrix is encoding that the marginals in the other direction recover the, the measure theta. So for example, let's Let's multiply this by x, and I get gamma x1 y1 plus gamma x2 y1 plus dot 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 plus gamma xn y1. So that's just how much mass was moved to y1, and it better be, you know, the amount in, in measure theta at point y1. All right, so in summary, this is the cost of our transport plan. And this constraints encode that we actually have a, a, a transport plan, namely a joint probability density function whose marginals are given by R and theta. Questions about how this linear programming problem sets up uh, optimal transport? Couple comments. There are some areas for improvement. So if my measures R and theta that I started with have only N um, columns and little bars and locations where they have mass, I actually have to really expand the size of my problem. You know, R and theta might only have N different places where they have mass but I needed a variable in my transport plan um, for each i and j. So if I have you know, n bars in R, n bars in theta, the number of variables I needed was n squared, right? The size of this entire transport plan matrix. So yeah, in other words, n rows and n columns gave me a matrix with n squared entries. So, so, so I've really blown up the size of this linear programming problem. And that's, that's not great when you want to implement this, right? You don't want to go to, from input of size n and n, and then in your uh, computer program, you now need n squared variables. So we'll improve that in the next, in the next video when we dualize things. Another area for improvement is that we'll actually be able to find the Wasserstein distance 
without finding a transport plan at all. So it's possible to not find this entire transport plan matrix, but still get out a real value Wasserstein distance. Finally, uh, another problem is that in training neural networks, you often take gradients. And in the particular application of Wasserstein GANs, you need to train by computing a gradient with respect to theta. Okay. Theta is incorporated for us as our constraints, right? We have all these constraints where, you know, theta appears in the marginals, giving half of our constraints. So when, when things are in the constraints, it's hard to take a gradient with respect to them. It's much easier to take a gradient with respect to things in the optimization function. So we're actually going to dualize it and we reduce the number of variables. We'll find a transport plan without, we'll find the Wasserstein distance without computing the transport plan. And theta will get moved from the constraints to the optimization function, allowing us to take a gradient with respect to theta more easily. Wonderful. Questions? Thanks so much.